all of the major world religions seem to share a similar kind of insanity. So we do have nuclear states that are Christian, we have nuclear states that are Muslim, we have nuclear states that are Jewish, and we have nuclear states that are Hindu. So it's a kind of equal opportunity insanity. And none of it's really tied to religion. Obviously, there's nothing in any particular religion that you know, is going to magnify the use. I, the, the point you make is, is well taken. And I think there are you know, nuclear threats in all sorts of directions. They come from states, they come from non-state actors, all sorts of things. The question is, to me, what's the way out? And the only way out that I see is for the nuclear states to take the NPT seriously and to take active steps to disarm, to create an international climate in which, you know, isolating, segregating, and disarming rogue non-state actors is really possible. There, you cannot eliminate groups like Al-Qaeda and others while the, the states that run the world continue with the policy they do. So, yes, there's threats all over the place, but you know, we live in the United States. Our primary target should be the U.S. government. And moving toward real nuclear abolition is the only thing that makes sense. We're committed to it by treaty. We're in violation of the treaty. There's all sorts of arguments one can use, political, moral, legal. And, and the organizing that's going to go on, from my point of view, isn't going to come from the folks you saw in the film. Right? Uh, it's going to come from, there's a, a Los Alamos study group, for instance, in which local activists in Los Alamos, a guy named Greg Mello runs it, has been working on this. They've been working on it for years. Uh, there is the American Friends Service Committee, the Quaker uh, group. I, I mentioned the book Empire and the Bomb. Joseph Gerson, the author of that, is the AFSC <coughs> point person on nuclear weapons. You saw a few people from something called the Program on Science and Global Security at Princeton University, uh, which is scientists, including its founder, Frank von Hippel, who was a nuclear physicist, who realized the insanity of it and created a, a program to try and provide the technical information as well as political support for this. So there's all sorts of people who are not part of, you know, these establishment sort of organizations that are trying to do work on this. And I think uh, if anybody in the audience knows more about actual organizing going on, especially its possible connections to existing anti-war groups and groups trying to work on the empire, by all means, um, you know, chime in. But those are the, the things I know about most directly. I think that the awareness of death is an essential part for the transformation of human consciousness. And I think what I learned from this film is that something not like the presence of uh, nuclear weapons is an essential piece of the transformation of global human consciousness that we can't fully develop as a planetary culture until we embrace the, and I love the way that they talk about probability and anything that can happen eventually will, that the presence of the ultimate death of humankind on this planet is a part of what it will take for us to evolve as a planetary culture and we ought to embrace the, the wisdom in light of that awareness. I think the phrase a death culture is very apt to describe the contemporary scene and, and how one transcends that is interesting. It reminded me that one of the real problems about nuclear weapons, I think, in the United States is that this country has never come to terms with the fact that its own singular use of nuclear weapons uh, was profoundly immoral. That the story we tell ourselves about the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki is mostly a lie. That the documentary evidence is, is there. And as I always make the point, professional historians, there is a consensus among the historians who study this. It's not just the radicals. It's among you know middle of the road, contemporary, professional historians, the consensus is very well established. The United States dropped the nuclear weapons on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, not so much to end war, World War II, but to gain advantage in the emerging struggle with the Soviet Union. That it was a political act, not a military act. That it was not necessary to end the war, and that the story that you know a million American soldiers would have died if we had to invade, all of that is basically a lie. I'm not even going to call it myth, it's just a lie. 
It was created to cover up the fact that U.S. officials engaged in one of the most, single most barbaric acts in recorded human history. And we have trouble coming to terms with that as a society. When the Smithsonian Institution uh, prepared to mount an, uh, an exhibition that was going to try and deal with this, not nearly as harshly as I am, but try to deal with it in the realm of reality, the reaction was overwhelming. It was shut down. There was a threat to defund the Smithsonian. I mean, it was a huge trauma because the country simply, this was in the 1990s, simply couldn't come to terms with the fact that one of our revered leaders, Harry Truman, you know, Mr. Uh, uh, straight talking man from Missouri was a moral monster on a scale that really defies the imagination. And that, in fact, what stems from that, from my point of view, is that there was a moment when this nuclear future could have been rolled back. It's when the nuclear scientists who were working on the Manhattan Project came to understand that Germany was nowhere near getting a bomb and that the justification that the United States had to develop, develop a bomb because Germany, if Germany had developed it first, we were going to be obliterated. When that was no longer a justification, a lot of the scientists within, or some of the scientists within the Manhattan Project, wrote a letter to FDR and said, this, we, have to, we have to pull the plug on this. We are you know, messing with horror. And the United States pursued it because it understood this would be a weapon that was a source of power. And that's the moment that I think, as a country, we have to come to terms with. That is the, the kind of country we live in. Right? And that's very hard to come to terms with. And it's, quite frankly, out of World War II, it's as difficult as I think it is for Germans to come to terms with what happened in the Nazi regime. There's one key difference. The Germans lost, and they were forced to reckon with that. We have never been forced to reckon with this. Right? And it's a profoundly disturbing reality, but it is, in fact, the reality. Do you think Eisenhower and, and did he have some kind of conversion experience between, you know, World War II and, and his, uh, his warnings about the military-industrial complex? Uh, first of all, I think repentance is a, an, an important concept, but it requires acknowledgement of reality. You cannot repent for sin when you do not recognize you have sinned. If you came up and said, if I was pure of heart and never sinned, which happens to be true in my case, of course, and you came to me and said, repent, what would I say? How can I repent for that which I have not committed? Right? So there's a, this is why the, you know, people I say, well, I don't want to, let's get out of history. You can't deal with reality until you've dealt with history. And so until we deal with that collective history, we can't collectively repent. I think. Eisenhower, I, Eisenhower's an interesting character because basically, as far as I can tell you, he's got great sort of retroactive PR. Everybody thinks about Ike as if he was this peacenik because he made one speech at the end of his tenure as president when he no longer was going to have power. You know, ex-presidents are very good at this is the Jimmy Carter model. You, know, you behave like every other president until you're out of power and then you, you have a conversion experience and you talk about all this stuff. And it's, it rings rather hollow for me. Right? Eisenhower, when I, I said Gerson has identified these 33 times the U.S. government has used nuclear blackmail, it includes times during the Eisenhower administration. Right? So no, Ike was no great um, seer on these things as far as I can tell. Star Wars was a name for an elaborate missile defense system uh, that the Reagan administra administration conjured up. Most people thought then, and would agree now, most sane people, that is, include people like me, um, <laughs> that it is technologically impossible to intercept missiles at the, the level that would really create a safe. It was the Reagan administration claiming this is how we make ourselves safe. Uh, politically, it was a disaster. We certainly don't have a functioning missile defense system like that. Uh, there were attempts to create some of the technology. Most of it never worked. So the, Ar the Air Force would do a test where they would create conditions in which it was almost impossible for it not to work, and then it wouldn't work. So it, it's a, in scientific terms, it's highly improbable <coughs> that it would work. What it did was, you know, derail significant yeah, yeah. arms reduction. And it also created a huge new technology uh, industry that the U.S. government would spend money on to subsidize the high-tech industry, which is a digression. Is, let's face it, is a big part of the U.S. military is a way to funnel money to high-technology industries um, from the, the U.S. government. And this was just another scam, as far as I can tell.